Welcome. We are now turning our attention on some of the most basic models for mathematical models of transmission, transmission of infectious diseases. Um, we are going to introduce or derive some models that will resemble um, you know, some similarities with models that you are already familiar with. Um, specifically, we're going to use ordinary differential equations. Um, so here the models are going to look similar to the models of interacting species or the replicator equations um, for the theoretical games. So before we introduce our first epidemic model, uh, we're going to review one of the most basic models of population dynamics. Uh, in a way, you've seen versions of these models in of this particular model in um, when we discuss interacting species. This model is called the logistic equation. Okay, and um, here we're assuming that x of t is a state variable denoting population size. It could be population size or it could be density, right? But x is a function of t and it denotes some type of volume, density, or population size. And the parameters, so here x is the state variable, and then we have two parameters. We have r and we have this parameter k. Okay, so um, let me clear this here. k is, in this model, we refer to k as the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity of a, of a population has to do with um, basically the number of individuals that can be sustained in the population. Okay, so uh, it has to do with uh, the availability of resources for that population to sustain a specific number of individuals. Um, on the other hand, the parameter R has to do with um, the rate of growth, in specifically, is called the intrinsic growth rate, um, and this parameter is um, has the meaning of uh, is quantifying the attained per capita growth rate in the case when the population size is so small that um, basically resources are uh, very available. Right, there is a. Uh, limitation of resources is, can be neglected due to the infinitesimal size of the population. Of course, I'm skipping several steps here. This is the ordinary differential equation. Ordinary differential equation. And there are uh, methods for computing. This is um, one of those ODEs that you can find uh, an explicit solution for this differential equation. There's something called separation of variables. And you can find that this expression here is the um, solution. Um, this, this is the solution of that ODE. That means this function, this expression, that is a function of time, but it has parameters k, and it has a parameter r over there. Um, this function satisfies that ordinary differential equation, right? So that's what it means for this to be a solution. So this is a well-known curve. Um, it has, you can argue this has the shape of an S, of the letter S, right? So you just have to have very good imagination as you're stretching that S, this curve has that type of shape. Um, these curves with this shape um, are very well known in population dynamics and theoretical biology and in certainly in many other applications. One of the important things is uh, it's easy to see here that if, if you take the limit as t goes to infinity, you'd be taking the limit of this expression here as t goes to infinity. Then as t goes to infinity, the only part of this expression, this is a ratio, the only part that has t in it is that exponential with exponent uh, is e to the minus rt. So as t goes, we know that e to the minus rt, this goes to zero as t goes to infinity, which means that this limit becomes k times x zero or x zero, and this becomes k. So the limit 
basically what we're saying here is that x approaches k. Um, here x, uh, from this calculation, we're concluding that x of t approaches the parameter k. x of t approaches the carrying capacity. So that's the, the um, x of t, the population size or population density, uh, when governed by this equation, uh, is such that this is telling us um, the population size will approach the carrying capacity. That's exactly what we're able to verify when we have a numerical solution of this equation. Um, the fact here, this is t and this is x of t. And this curve is behaving in this form. So that means that uh, the fact that x of t is flat, right, is, is uh, telling us that x of t is converging to a horizontal asymptote. Here, this k value is a horizontal asymptote. And so turns out that to come up with this illustration, you have to have, you have to plug in specific values for the parameters, right? This is a mathematical model, it's an equation, if you have parameter values, then you're going to obtain a numerical solution, right? And so what we can conclude here from this illustration is that this value at which x of t is converging, it seems that here k is approximately 400, based on on what the graph is telling us, right? So um, this logistic curve, um, this this type of growth is well understood. It's called logistic growth. And basically we just summarize several features of this. So this is gonna serve as a basis for what um, one of the first models what we will introduce. Okay, so the first model we will introduce uh, is going to consist of two compartments. Okay, but we, uh, before we start writing equations, we have to make assumptions. Okay, so we're going to derive this model. We're going to first assume that is a there is a population um, that has n capital N individuals, and also that these individuals are mixing homogeneously at random. So we're going to assume that this population n, so think of we have a population of size n, but now think uh, that this population of size n is actually split here. You can think of this being divided into two groups. Okay, One group is going to be called S, and the other group is going to be called I. So. This is the idea. You have one population of a specific size, a number of individuals, and now you think that these individuals may actually be in one of two groups, and you label or classify or name these groups according to the status, um, the so-called epidemiological status. Okay, S is going to denote individuals that are healthy and are not infected. Uh, so typically they are called susceptible, and I is going to um, denote the group of individuals that are infected, and we're going to assume that they are both infected and capable of passing the infection immediately. Uh, so we assume they are infected and infectious, okay? So we assume we have two groups. Um, so we have I, those individuals that are capable of passing infectious, in, uh, in the infectious agent. So we call the I individuals infectious. And then we have those who are not infected and they are denoted by the letter S. Um, this is the illustration I showed you at the beginning. Uh, N is divided, is split into S and I. So we're going to say S plus I. We're going to assume that S added to I adds up to the total size of the population. So every individual in this population, um, we're going to assume that every individual has, on average, the same number of contacts. Okay, So we're going to assume that 
uh, an average number of contacts, an average number of contacts B is the same number for every individual in this population of capital N individuals. Okay, so we're going to assume that um, B here denote that average number of contacts per individual. So if B denotes, let's write something here. So if we have that B denotes the average number of contacts per individual, um, then we can say that I over N is the fraction of infectious individuals and therefore this product, um, the, this, this quantity B times I over N denotes basically the budget, the budgeted amount of those average number of contacts, how many of those that are budgeted to individuals in the I group with infectious individuals. So when we multiply that average number times this fraction, we're basically correcting the average number and this quantity gives us uh, how many of those contacts are spent, how many uh, of, those, of these contacts are spent with individuals in the compartment we're calling I, in the I compartment, okay? Um, another note here is that we are assuming um, homogeneous random mixing, right? We're assuming random, but when we say random here, we mean uniformly at random. Uniform and random means unbiased, right? So having this term, I over N, it's also not a coincidence that is uh, exactly consistent with the assumption of unbiased, unbiasedness, right? There is an unbiased chance to encounter individuals in the I compartment. So we have that B times I over N is how many of the average number of contacts are spent with I individuals. And this would be, uh, remember, B is the average number of contacts per individual. Um, B times I over N is the fraction of the average number of contacts per individual that are spent with I individuals. Now, if we add up that over the number of individuals in the S compartment, then this quantity S times B I over N. So basically this is what's happening. We start with an average number B. Uh, this B is corrected by how many of those contacts are spent with I individuals. And this gives us a quantity per individual. And now we add up that we have S individual in the S compartment. So we have the quantity S times B times I over N. Okay. So this now um, gives us the total count of contacts obtained uh, when adding up over all individuals in the, uh, in the compartment we're calling S. So we have B, S, I over N. So basically this quantity is the total number of contacts between individuals in both of these groups, okay? Uh, this is a rough count, though, because remember, we started with the assumption that B denotes the average number of contacts and that that average number of contacts is the same for all individuals. Okay, so this is a rough, uh, raw estimate or uh, rough count of the total number of contacts between individuals in the S compartment and the I compartment. Now, let's uh, consider that quantity B times S times I divided by N, but let's now consider that quantity multiplied by this uh, quantity here, P, okay? P is going to denote, this quantity here is going to denote P is gonna be the probability that given a contact probability uh, of infection successful infection, basically probability of infection given a contact. So uh, in our introduction uh, to this topic, we discussed that there are different modes of transmission. There are different um, 
according to the pathogen, there are different ways. There are some pathogens that are airborne. There are uh, other pathogens that are transmitted by sexual contact. There are other pathogens that require a vector, which is an intermediary. So not every contact is successful in um, carrying on or passing on the pathogen, right? So even though you may have contacts between those individuals that are carrying the infectious agent and those individuals that do not have it, uh, that doesn't mean that every contact is going to lead to an infection. So there is a degree of randomness there. There is a degree of uncertainty, and that's precisely what this parameter here, P, uh, denotes. It denotes the probability of infection given a contact. So what we're going to do is that we're going to say, uh -huh. so we're going to take this expression here. We're going to say, you know, let beta denote P times B or, you know, B times B. So B is the average number of contacts. P is the probability of infection given a contact. And now this parameter beta is going to be called the transmission, the transmission rate, the rate at which um, infection is passed on. So this is a rate is going to have uh, units of one over time. Okay, but uh, we're going to assume that B times P is uh, denoted here with beta. So we have this expression. We have the expression beta times S times I divided by N. And this expression is what will be called the number of new cases of infection. Okay, the number of new cases of infection. So here is a schematic of the model that we are deriving. Uh, we have two groups, S and I, and um, there will be transitions, and this is really, um, there are basically two types of processes going on here that uh, we are taking into account into these equations. Um, the processes that involve these arrows, uh, these are called demographic. processes. Demographic, because these processes are denoting um, birth of individuals and death of individuals. Okay, so demographic processes. They take into account um, standard processes uh, for the total population. Okay. And the other type of processes that is going on here uh, is what's going on in this arrow and also what goes on in this other arrow, okay? Those are the so-called epidemic These are part of the epidemic processes Okay, so that is the way in which new infections are produced, and then there is also the way in which infections are maybe, well, in which infections are depleted. So we can say that these epidemic processes involve things that are similar in spirit to birth of infection and death of infection, um, but uh, you can also phrase these in terms of gains for the infection process or losses, okay? So you can see that uh, coming into the I compartment here, the compartments are denoted by boxes. So this arrow is coming into this I compartment uh, and this is the amount that comes in. So this is a gain for the I, compa I compartment and out of the I compartment, this arrow is going out and this is the amount that goes out of the I compartment. So the gain for the I compartment has to do with beta S times I divided by n, the loss in the I compartment has to do with gamma I. So once we have decided in some notation for the compartments and we have some notation for the parameters of the model, it's easy um, or it's in, very intuitive to draw this diagram with boxes 
and draw arrows out of one box going into another box or out of boxes and so on and then we can write on top of the arrows uh, expressions involving uh, here you have to uh, realize that s is a function of time and i is also a function of time these are the so-called state variables okay so um, we'll have expressions involving the state variables and also involving the parameter um, the, the mod parameters in this case the parameters of this mod according to what we have written here are mu gamma and beta right there are three parameters very good so um, so let's write some equations so I, I said something about the gain in the compartment i being beta times s times i over n and the loss in i being uh, something that involves gamma i notice that as this quantity is a gain for i that arrow is coming out of s which means this quantity will be a loss in the s, in the s compartment uh, on the other hand uh, gamma i is a loss in the i compartment but it will be a gain for the susceptible the uh, compartment for the compartment with susceptibles okay so we write the differential equations um, by using those principles if we have arrows coming in that will be a term in the differential equation that is positive if the arrow is going out then that term in the differential equation would be negative uh, here for simplicity the demographic process is model in such a way uh, maybe what is missing here is that n equals s plus i so here we construct demographic process processes such that we assume that mu is um, a constant rate this mu here well every, all of them are constants right but um, basically uh, mu is the constant death rate so individuals die due to some natural process of death um, at a constant rate that's what it is assumed so they is the same constant uh, at which individuals in the uh, susceptible compartment die, individuals in the infectious compartment die at the same constant rate. So if mu is the constant death rate, then by this construction, one over mu is the um, mean or average life um, lifespan. Maybe we can't fit that here, lifespan, right? Um, that means that this is the average number of time units an individual is alive in this population, okay? Um, in some populations, in general, in terms of, demo, you know, something that has nothing to do with dying due to specific causes of infections, but in some populations, dying due to natural causes means that sometimes uh, this mean life expectancy um, could be in some populations approximately 70 years 70 or 75 in some populations is a little is the average um, the average amount of time an individual remains alive in a population in some countries could be 70 in some countries could be 80 right so between 70 and 80 so uh, that's to give you some perspective okay so then uh, this construction involves we have a term going into the s and to the susceptible compartment right and so this is uh, a little artif artificial it's just so we have a construction here that satisfies uh, an assumption of conservation of mass uh, and, and also satisfies an assumption of having a constant population okay <clears throat> this is what is called conservation mass that means that at any given time s of t plus i of t add up to n and n here is a constant uh, here we assume the rate of death is constant so individuals are uh, susceptible individuals and infected individuals are dying at the same constant rate and uh, we assume that for the total population those losses okay mu 
times s and mu times i are lose losses on the total population, that those losses are replaced is exactly in the same magnitude uh, with um, arrivals or gains on the total population. So this, you can also think of this as departures, right? And then that we have some type of replacement there. Think of every time there is a death, then a newborn arrives into the population. And by um, setting that arrow, mu n, going into the susceptible compartment, what we are assuming here is that newborns are assumed susceptible. We're assuming the newborns are born susceptible. They are born free of infection, okay? So you may have your strong opinions as to all the uh, assumptions that we have to build this model with two equations, and that is very good. Uh, but this is the process of constructing a model. You always have a set of assumptions and then you derive some mathematical expressions and then you can add more reality or more complexity um, and so on. So let's review the terms. Here we have the new arrivals. These are the newborns that are assumed to be susceptible. Uh, these are the losses in the susceptible compartment due to natural death uh, processes, right? So these terms are the... Um, uh, the demographic, the demographic terms, and then we have um, the term minus beta times s times i divided by n, right? This is a, an, an epidemiological term. This is uh, the term that denotes the new infections, new infections that are losses for the susceptible compartment, and precisely the same term which is a loss for one compartment, it's a gain for the other compartment. So these are new infections. And a gamma here denotes the rate at which individuals stop being infectious, okay? So you can call gamma here some kind of recovery because the infection stops, uh, some kind of recovery rate. Uh, and this is a fairly simplistic model. We assume here that when the infection stops, individuals become immediately susceptible again. So they go back. The, here is the term minus gamma i, a loss for the infectious compartment, and that term appears positive in the susceptible compartment. It's a gain for the compartment of susceptibles, okay? And the last term in the last equation, minus mu i, um, that term is also a demographic term. This is what we can do with these two equations. Maybe I tell you one more thing. So we're assuming that n is equal to s plus i, right? This is the so-called conservation of mass. And so what happens if now we take the derivative of um, this expression with respect to time? So it would be taking the derivative of s plus the derivative of i, right? And if we add up these expressions, then we find quickly that everything cancels. So that means that dn dt equals zero. And this is what we would use to conclude that n is a constant, because we know that uh, the derivative of a constant is zero, okay? So population, this is a way of verifying that our construction is consistent with having a population uh, that has constant size. At any given time point, the size of that population remains equal to n, which is a constant. Now, because of uh, that fact, since the population size is constant, then we can do the following substitution. We can say, okay, we know that n equals s plus i, so let's substitute s with n minus i, okay? So we can rewrite the second equation. Uh, remember, this used to be beta. This was beta times s times i over n. But what we're doing is that we're substituting, we're substituting s with um, the expression n minus i. And then this starts looking like this. This is where the fun part starts, right? So now we're done. We're gonna do some algebra. We're gonna clean up this a little bit. Um, and turns out we can factor out. We can factor out this term. This this is a constant, but this is the term beta minus gamma minus mu. 
we can factor this term out. There is a lot of uh, i, the, the state variable i is repeated there. Uh, so we can also take i as a common factor. Okay, and then we'll be left with an expression that looks like one minus i divided by some number. Okay, so we're gonna even write this in a, a, an even a much more compact form. Okay, we're gonna use a new parameter here, and we're gonna rewrite this expression uh, with this with this substitution by setting r zero to be equal to beta over gamma plus mu, we can rewrite, this still looks like this portion here is a constant times a state variable i times quantity one minus i over some kind of constant, okay? So you could um, argue that this starts looking as a pattern, starts looking very similar. Let's say this constant is r and let's call this constant k. So this looks like r times i times 1 minus i over k, okay? And di dt equals r times i times quantity 1 minus i over k. Here we're assuming that r is gamma plus mu times quantity r0 minus 1, and k is n times quantity 1 minus 1 over r0. So this is all to say that when we make the substitution, we can reduce that model with two compartments into one ordinary differential equation and this ordinary differential equation starts resembling, starts looking very similar to the equation we first discussed which is called the logistic model, okay? Looking very similar. So this is our reduced version of the model. Turns out we can, um, indeed this, this model support solutions that are very similar to uh, what we had seen before. You can compute numerical solutions using L, using the R um, solver L soda for differential equations. Here are some illustrations and what we're illustrating here is that now this quantity, this ratio, beta divided by gamma plus mu, this is going to determine the behavior here. So we are gonna have um, we're gonna have uh, some scenarios. Uh, you, you could, this is a, a differential equation that you could find an explicit solution that will look very similar to the logistic one, but here we're uh, doing some commentary based on numerical solutions. The important thing here is that when R0 is greater than one, when you choose values, when the values of beta, gamma, and mu are such that beta divided by quantity gamma plus mu is exceeds one, is bigger, larger than one, then, then what we find is that i of t converges to n times one minus one over r zero, okay? And that's precisely these, these curves here in these simulations. In blue, you have the solution for when values were chosen so that R0 is 3.3, and you can see the behavior, right? It has that, uh, it's a little sharp at the beginning, but it has that S shape we talk about for logistic curves. And then the next value of R0 that was tested here was choosing values of the parameters that, that are such that R0 is 2.5. And here is the numerical solution also converging to that carrying capacity, right? This, this here is the carrying capacity. And when R0 is 1.7, then um, the shape is consistent, right? So you, we, we have the result. When R0 is greater than 1, I of t converges to this constant value, okay? You can say that uh, here also I of t denotes a number of infectious individuals, but typically we would say that this is prevalence. This is a very common name for the number of infectious individuals, prevalence. And when R0 is greater than one, prevalence converges to a constant value, okay? And so um, this is some kind of also endemic level, right? This is the level of the infectious population at equilibrium, okay? Now, 
look at what happens when values of parameters are chosen such that R0 is less than 1. So when R0 is less than 1, we can also write this when R0 is smaller than 1, then I of t, the prevalence, goes to 0. Okay, that's what we observe for every uh, example here. Values of parameters were chosen such that R0 is half, is 0.5, R0 is almost a third, 0.3, and then half zero, uh, R0 is 0.2. And in all these illustrations, we can see that I of t converges to 0. This is basically extinction. Is extinction of infection. Okay, so there are two scenarios, and those scenarios are um, determined by the values of this quantity around one, whether they are below one or they are above one. If they are above one, the infection uh, settles at an endemic level, uh, positive equilibrium level. And if they are below one, the infection goes to zero. This is one of those uh, scenarios that we call extinction. Okay. And so, lastly, is um, we're gonna do an extension of this methodology, and we're gonna have model here that has not just two compartments. This model is gonna have four compartments. Okay. So we're gonna say the terminology is very consistent, very similar. So S here denotes the susceptible. These are individuals that are not infected, okay? Um, I denotes individuals that are infectious. Infectious, that means that they are capable of passing the infection, okay? Passing on. Um, also, we're going to have here a compartment called R, which is the state uh, that individuals go to after they kick off the infection, after the immune system is able to control that infection and they are no longer uh, passing on infection. Uh, this um, state, we can call them recovered. These are recovered individuals. Now you may wonder what is this state called E? Well, this is for a scenario in which uh, individuals are infected, yet they are not infectious. So this is a scenario in which individuals that are infected undergo a latency period uh, or undergo some, some period of incubation. Okay, so sometimes this is denoted with the letter E because uh, is to denote exposure. So these individuals are called exposed. Okay, this means they are um, undergoing latency, um, and that has to do with some type of incubation, right? So they carry the pathogen. Um, however, they are not capable of producing gains for infections yet they're not capable of passing on this pathogen okay the rationale here is very similar as to the expressions we wrote before um, the main epidemiological process the main process of transmission of infection here has to do with this term which denotes the contacts between those individuals that are not infected and individuals that are passing on the infection Right? So this is a term beta times S times I over N. And then um, transitions out of I are still denoted in this form, a constant times the state variable. Uh, and we're gonna assume th these are linear transitions. This is the, the rate out of I is linear. Uh, so we're gonna assume that individuals are um, moving from the latency uh, compartment um, or the exposed compartment into the actively infected or infectious compartment also at a linear rate. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, and you may notice that here there is not such thing as arrows going out and nothing coming in. We could add those things, but um, we don't have nothing like that right now. So this model is ignoring any demographic process. This model is neglecting, there is no errors denoting 
death, uh, natural death, and there is not an arrow here for newborns. Okay, we're explicitly uh, concentrating here on the epidemiological process, the infection process. So um, the differential equation for S is minus beta times S times I over N. Here is the differential equation for the compartment of exposed individuals. Right? You can see the gain uh, appears as a positive term and the arrow out appears here with a negative. Um, the differential equation for I uh, has the arrow coming in as positive, the arrow going out as negative, and then the differential equation for R has only one arrow coming in, so it only has one positive term. Okay, so it turns out that you can um, do experiments, numerical experiments with these equations. Uh, we still have the conservation of mass assumption, so we're assuming now the total population splits not just in two compartments, but in four compartments. And if you set values for the parameters and you use um, the solver that we've been using so, uh, so far, we use L soda, then you can compute numerical solutions that look uh, in this form. Okay, so here you have the numerical solutions uh, that we obtain after choosing specific values. You need parameter values to compute this. You need parameter values. And you also need initial conditions. So you need values for beta. So what are the parameters here? The parameters are beta, uh, kappa, gamma, that's it, beta, kappa, the transmission rate beta, uh, kappa is the activation rate from exposed into infectious, and gamma is the recovery rate, okay? You have values for those three parameters, then you would need also initial conditions. Initial conditions are what is the number of S at zero, what is the number of E at time zero, what is the number of I at time zero, and what is the number of R at time zero. This should be zero. Typically, both of those are zero. You just need numbers for what is the number, the initial number of susceptible, and what is the initial number of infectious. So, for these simulations, we assume that beta has a value of 5, kappa has a value of 1, gamma has a value of 1, and then we made these assumptions for the initial conditions. Okay? So, you should uh, immediately, you should rush off. Uh, to the computer, open R or R Studio and code up these equations uh, using the solver L Sora. And with these parameter values and these initial conditions, you should obtain numerical solutions that are very, very similar to the solutions we have here. So this concludes our discussion on compartmental models for basic compartmental models for infectious diseases.